We're all too familiar with the concept of social distancing these days, aren't we? I'm amazed at even how quickly our three-year-old has cottoned onto it and the way that she veers across to one side of the road when we see people passing us. But it's hard, right? Not being able to hug our parents, cuddle our grandchildren, spend time with our friends in their homes, be around the people we love and meet together as church in person is really tough. Interestingly, the Bible speaks of another kind of distancing. It's a distancing that leaves us lost and reckless and empty. It's the distancing that we choose when we hold God at arm's length, preferring to go our own way rather than his. And it's beautifully and poignantly illustrated in today's Bible passage. Now, as with Jesus' other parables, this is a story with a deeper meaning. Jesus tells this parable to a whole host of people who've gathered round him to hear him speak. Tax collectors, people who would have been known as sinners, and Pharisees who thought they were holy and righteous, but really weren't. And so there's something in this parable for all of those people, something for them to hook onto, to identify with, to understand more about God's character through. So shall we pray before we go any further? God, we want to ask that as we delve deeper into this parable, you would speak to us too. Challenge us, convict us, God, and help us to have hearts that are open to what you want to say to us this morning. Amen. So both sons in this story distancing, distance themselves from their father. Let's take them in turn. The younger son, after prematurely demanding his inheritance from his father, gathers all he has together and sets off for a distant country to enjoy some wild living. Now, reading through commentaries on this passage again made me realise just how painful the younger son's actions must have been for his father. When the father divided the property between the two sons and the younger son turned his share into cash, this must have meant that the younger son sold his share to someone else. The shame that that would have brought on the family within that culture at that time would have been immense. And this is on top of the shame that the son has already brought on the father by asking for his share of the inheritance before his father's death. In effect, he's saying to his dad, I wish you were dead already. Can you imagine the utter pain that that must have brought the father? And yet the father doesn't argue with or rebuke his son. He does as he's asked, he gives the son what he asks and he lets him live out his choice. Have we been or are we being like the younger son? We can be proud, can't we? Although we might not admit it to others or even to ourselves a lot of the time, we think we know better than God. We don't need him. We'll certainly have more fun without him. A bit like the younger son, we'd like the inheritance but we're not really up for the responsibility that goes with the status of being a son. It's interesting that the younger son travels to a distant land to do his independent, hedonistic, self-focused, wild living. Now, I always imagined this land to be kind of the Middle Eastern equivalent of Las Vegas as his sort of good time location of choice. But actually, reading around a bit more widely, I wonder if there is a deeper significance to the younger son travelling to a, a distant land. The younger son had a home, he had status, he had security, he had responsibility, and yet he chose to leave all of those things behind in his quest to become independent, to prove his own merit, to stand on his own two feet. Henry Nuon who has written a whole book about this parable, thinks that leaving home for a distant country is actually what many of us do a lot of the time. And he says this, I'm constantly surprised at how I keep taking the gifts God has given me, my health, my intellectual and emotional gifts, and keep using them to impress people, receive affirmation and praise and compete for rewards instead of developing them for the glory of God. Yes, I often carry them off to a distant country and put them in the service of an exploiting world that does not know their true value. It's almost as if I want to prove to myself and to my world that I do not need God's love, that I can make a life on my own, that I want to be fully independent. Beneath it all is the great rebellion, the radical no to the father's love, 
the unspoken curse, I wish you were dead. The prodigal son's no reflects Adam's original rebellion. And I wonder if that resonates with some of us this morning. Do we distance ourselves from the father when our true home is right here with him? Do we take the gifts and the skills that he's given us, our inheritance, and use them in ways and in places which do not glorify God? Well, later on, the younger son's pride gives way to shame, doesn't it? His money's gone, he's totally alone, and he is reduced to feeding pigs. And he's in such desperate need that he longs to eat the slops he feeds them to fill his empty stomach. Now, for a Jewish person, like those who would have been listening to this story, pigs are seen as unclean. And to be working with them would have been the ultimate degradation, the lowest of lows. There would have been nothing more shameful than this for the younger son and no place lower to sink. And it's easy to get caught up in shame, isn't it? To allow shame to determine how we live. I wonder if, a bit like the younger son, we can allow our shame to create a distance between us and our loving Heavenly Father. How often do we think to ourselves, I'm not good enough for God, I've messed up too much for him to accept me, I can't go back, he'll never be able to love me the way I am. It must have taken courage for the younger brother to return home. Ashamed, degraded, having wasted his entire inheritance and aware of how undeserving he is, he doesn't expect his father to welcome him back as a son, but hopes instead simply to be employed as a servant. Is that significant for some of us reading that passage this morning? Do we think that we can't come home? Maybe we feel like we've sinned too much, we've strayed too far, you know, we've severed all ties. Perhaps we feel like we don't know how to come home to God. Um, We may want it. We want that freedom, that forgiveness, that love, security. But perhaps we just don't know the way back home to find it. But the younger son does return home, doesn't he? And in verse 20, we read the response of the father, which is the most beautiful illustration of God's grace to us in all our shame. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. In a culture where senior figures were seen as far too dignified to run anywhere, this father hitches up his robes and runs towards his undeserving son. The son who has wished his father dead and wasted his entire inheritance, who deserves a rebuke, gets thrown a party. Totally unmerited, totally undeserved. The love and the forgiveness of the father to the wayward son is freely given and lavishly abundant. It's worth remembering that we are, we're still in Pentecost at the moment. And a couple of weeks, Pete spoke to us about how through the Holy Spirit, God makes his home in us. And we read here about how it's the father that runs to the son when he was still a long way off. We might feel like we don't know the way home to God, but actually, let's be reminded, we are God's home. All we have to do is welcome him in. Let's move on to the older son. So he's not as bad as the younger son, right? Um, You know, at least he doesn't demand his inheritance early and then squander it. Well, that's what I used to think. Uh, in fact, I used to have a lot of sympathy for the older brother. It seems like he does everything he's supposed to. You know, he toes the line. And yet it's his undeserving younger brother that gets thrown a party. But actually, he has no more respect for his father than the younger brother does. He lectures his father in front of his guests. He refuses his plea to come in and join the party. And he won't acknowledge his own brother. He's so caught up in his own righteousness, in the inheritance that he believes he has earned and so deserves, that he can't bring himself to be happy that his brother is back in the family. He says to his father, I've been slaving for you all these years, when actually they were working as partners. The father had already divided his assets between the two sons. And presumably this is part of his issue because he knows that anything that's spent on the younger son will now be coming out of his inheritance. 
1 John 1 tells us, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The younger brother might have been proud in thinking that he'd be better off alone. But the older brother was proud too, in thinking that he'd somehow earned his inheritance and too proud to be able to celebrate his younger brother's return. Now, the character of the older brother would have struck a very uncomfortable chord with the Pharisees listening to Jesus' story. They would have known that he was speaking directly to them. The older brother says to his father, I've never disobeyed a single command of yours. Well, that was their claim, their boast of moral superiority. Just like the older brother, they couldn't understand how the sinners could possibly be worthy of forgiveness. The audaciousness of God's grace, you know, freely given, not earned or deserved, was offensive to them. And again, I wonder, can we be a bit like that? Do we ever put our identity in following the rules rather than living freely under God's grace? Do we get caught up in religion rather than relationship? Do we ever look around at those around us and think, well, at least I'm not as bad as them? I wonder if many of us might actually have more in common with the older brother than we'd like to admit. I think I have. (laughs) And if so, are we willing to ask God what he might want to challenge us about this morning? Is it jealousy? Anger? Resentment? Maybe a tendency to complain? Because the truth is that if we are caught up in these attitudes like the older brother was, we might have stayed home but actually we're just as distant from the father as the younger brother was. At one point or another in our lives, we will likely to be able to identify with both the sons in this story. But actually, the father's response is the same to them both. Neither brother deserved their father's generosity, but he gives all of himself and all that he has to both of them. And just like that, God's grace covers us all. It's not dependent on who we are or what we've done. It is a free gift given in love, bought at a great cost through Jesus' death on the cross. But for the grace of God, we would remain distant forever. You know, we might feel like lockdown is lasting forever, but actually it is a fleeting moment compared to the eternity that we face separated from God if we choose not to accept the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. None of us can earn his approval, deserve his forgiveness or be worthy of his love. But because of the great love of the Father, we get to be called sons and daughters, to break free of our self-imposed lockdowns, to run to the Father who runs to us and return his tight bear hug of love to enjoy our inheritance alongside him forever, but for the grace of God. However we do it, why ever we do it, let's not distance ourselves from the God who loves us. There is no need to. Our loving father waits for us, longs for us to return home. God's grace is always bigger than our sin. All we need to do is acknowledge how desperately we need it. Let's pray. Lord, we want to acknowledge and confess our sin before you now. Help us to know the ways in which we're like the brothers in this story. We bring our pride before you now and ask you to forgive us. God, thank you that your grace is always bigger than our sin. Thank you that when we are distant from you, you run towards us, closing the gap and ending our isolation. Thank you, Father, that we are your beloved children, that you call us sons and daughters and that our true home is with you.
And Father, we thank you for who you are. That like the Father in this story, time and time again, you pour out your loving kindness on us, even though we don't deserve it. Thank you, God, that you don't treat us the way we treat you. You are loving, forgiving and kind to us and we are so grateful. And Father, we know that you want us to treat other people that way too. Please show us who we can demonstrate that kind of love to today. We want to be more like you, our loving, forgiving, gentle and gracious Father. Amen.